Well, all righty then. Yeah, it is. That's awesome. That's, that is so great, and that is true. He is wonderful, great, awesome, and majestic, and has the whole world in his hand. That's a little song we used to sing, isn't it? He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Yeah, he's got you and me, brother, in his hands. Well, anyway, there you go. <laughs> Oldie but goody, oldie but goody. But is there any more truth than that? No, there's no more truth than that. He has the whole world in his hands, and he always has. And uh, the comforting thing is that he always will have. And that these um, intentions of man and these workings of systems and uh, activities and uh, evil and all of those things, uh, they don't have a chance against God. It's just unbelievable. I, I know that uh, in the last uh, by, well, basically the last four or five months, our whole attention as a, as a nation has been turned to an election that we were going to, that we had. And, um, and, and all the news that dominated the news screens, no matter which channel you watched, were about the election and about accusations and about charges and about who was going to win and all these things, all this intrigue and all this social stuff. And, and it distracted us from something that was really important. I don't know if you guys paid attention to this. If you did, you would probably be uh, some of few that paid attention to anything in the last three or four months that, have ha that has happened concerning Israel. Uh, had this happened, had these things happened before the last three or four months, they, well, maybe before President Trump became president, they would have been considered the most dynamic, uh, tremendous events that ever happened on the face of the earth. The, it, I'm talking about the peace accords mm -hmm. with Israel and, and a couple of Arab states. Now three, actually, uh, this week, this past week, the Sudan entered. Uh, this is a phenomenal thing, guys. And let me just tell you this, and, and so you can watch from now on. Anything that ever has to do with Israel Pay attention to it because it is extremely vital as to where we are in the lineup of the end of things because end times prophecy is all about Israel. It's, it, it, it has to do with Israel. It's all about Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye because of the covenant with Abraham. God made that covenant with Abraham. He kept, he's keeping that covenant with Abraham. And all through, all through the history of the word of God, all the prophecies that have been spoken, all of the promises that have been made, all of the timings that have been so intricately fashioned throughout the prophetic word of God is all about Israel. It's all about, it's all about that, that tiny little dot over there that seems to be the center and the focus of the entire world. You know, it's, it, it's amazing to me because uh, when I was young, uh, young <laughs> when I was young, I, in the 70s when I was really young, in my 20s, um, I preached a, a lot about prophecy. And, and I shared a lot of things. And boy, I was so enthusiastic and so pumped and so fired up because uh, when you're young, th those kind of things really intrigue you, you know, the, 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 all of that. Well, uh, one of the things that, that crossed my mind many times in, when I was preaching these things coming on up was how in the world could one little something be so dominating that the whole world would be, would be after it? You know, uh, how could one little seemingly insignificant as far as the world w would be considered dot of... Of, of, of humanity in the middle of the desert over there, and the mountains and the hills and, and, and just barrenness. How, how could that be, become the focus of everything? But of course, in these last few years, I no longer ask questions like that because I see how some little tiny anything once the focus gets on it, it can be blown to any proportion or magnitude 
that it needs to be blown to and everybody's attention can be captured by something that you know, is, is minor, is, is middling. It just takes the crazy media to just start focusing everything on it and all of a sudden it becomes the focus of the entire world. And we've watched that. Well, I'm just saying that pay attention to Israel. And when anything happens concerning Israel, it's vitally important to where we are in end time things. Now, I'm going to read this because I will get all bogged down and I don't want to get bogged down in this one thing. And I'm going to read what I wrote in the introduction to the handout, the student handout that you have. If, if you have one, I'm just going to be reading that. I hate to bore you with it, but it'll save me a lot of time because I will get bogged down in, in this. Uh, the, I'm going to mention this before I start reading it uh, because I'm going to mention a war, a war that's going to happen in the end times. This is an end time war. It is not the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon happens at the end of the tribulation period. Seven years, the Antichrist is on the earth. At the end of that period, there is a war, a battle called the battle of Armageddon, where Jesus will actually physically step out of heaven, step on this earth, which that is the second coming. The second coming is not the rapture. The rapture, he comes in the clouds, we go up to meet him. He doesn't actually touch the earth. That's not his second coming, that's the rapture. The second coming is when he steps on this earth with his feet and the mountains split and he fights the battle of Armageddon. So just, I want you to know that. So this war that is going to be fought in the end times and it is definitely an end times war. It is a latter day war. It's identified that way by Ezekiel, dynamically identified that way. It is going to happen and whether it happens <clears throat> at the beginning of tribulation, probably not because some of the things he says has to happen can't happen in those seven years of tribulation. It's probably gonna happen at some time before tribulation. I don't know how far before tribulation. Some historians, biblical historians, think maybe three and a half years before the tribulation starts, the, the war of Gog and Magog, but that's just pure speculation. It will happen, and it will happen before the tribulation, but just how far in advance, I don't know. But you can see the forces lining up right now. So we're talking about a Gog and Magog war here in Ezekiel 38, and that's what this introduction is about. All right, let me get on. Prophecy is writing history before it happens. Approximately 30% of the Bible is prophecy and most of it is end times prophecy. There has never been a time in history that has received as much prophetic attention as now. What does that say to us? Well, it tells us that God wants us to know what's going on. Aren't you glad that in these days of social unrest, economic and political upheaval, climate change hoaxes, COVID-19 and all the rest, that God cares enough to tell us what's going to happen so that we will know how to respond. On September the 15th, 2020, a significant event took place at the White House as President Trump and the United Arab Emirates Foreign Minister, hard name, hard name, hard name, hard name, Bahrain's Foreign Minister, hard name, hard name, hard name, and the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, revealed what is now called the Arab, I mean the Abraham Accords. The Accords are a declaration of peace, cooperation, and constructive, diplomatic, and friendly relations. It, it, it's called normalization is the big political word. It, they, they normalize. That means in every way they cooperate with other, each other with tourism and trade and economic. In other words, these are normal relationships. That's the, that's the treaty they signed called the Abraham Accord. In January of 2021, remember this is just the 10th day, so it was this past week, they were also joined by the Sudan. When President Trump took office, now this is why this is significant. When President Trump took office, just two Arab nations, Egypt and Jordan, had peace treaties with Israel or even recognized Israel's right to exist. The Abraham Accords added three more, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Sudan. What is so unusual about that? Well, for 31 years, from 1948 until 1979, not a single 
Middle Eastern nation made peace with Israel. 16 years later, the next Middle Eastern nation to make peace with Israel was Jordan in 1994. Since then, not a single Islamic Middle Eastern nation has made peace with Israel. That is, until now, 26 years later. It's amazing to me that at this time in history with the geopolitical upheaval and unrest that we have in our world today, that any Middle Eastern predominantly Muslim nation would join with Israel in a, in a peace treaty. The prophet Ezekiel told us what the geopolitical world was going to look like in 2,600 years. He describes an end times war in which many nations will come against tiny Israel to destroy her. And only four nations will protest and speak against the invasion. Two of these nations are Muslim Arabs and they just entered the Abraham Accords. The other two are Great Britain and the United States. The War of Gog and Magog will kick off a set of well-timed prophetic events that will conclude with Armageddon. And then for a little drama, I put in there, the clock is ticking, <laughs> what time is it? Just know this about prophecy and about timing. It's very specific. Uh, God gives timing. The book of Daniel in your Old Testament the last six chapters are all about prophecy and one of the greatest prophecies concerning the timing of events is called Daniel's 70 weeks. It's very specific, very precise, and it even tells us when Christ would be crucified. So God has timings in prophecy, but know this, when Israel is in the land, the clock is ticking. When Israel's removed from the land, the clock stops. When they come back into the land, it starts ticking. And when they get out, it stops. Now, what did Ezekiel say the world was going to look like in 2020? He wrote this 2,600 years ago. And here's what he says. This is in Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 10. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying... Son of man, set your face against Gog, which seems to be a person, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, which is an ancient spelling of Russia, Meshach, which is Moscow, and Tubal, which is Tbilisk, which was the, um, the uh, uh, military capital of, of Russia. These, this concerns, the, the, all of these states are, are Central Asia today, and they're all inhabited by all of those stands, you know, Kazakhstan, uh, Krygistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, blah, 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 all the stands. If it's a stand, it's a Muslim nation, and it's part of, it's part of this confederacy here. All right, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around, and I'll put hooks in your jaws, and I'll lead you out with all of your horses, with all of your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, which is Iran, as a matter of fact, Iran was called Persia until 1935 when they changed the name to the People's Republic of Iran. Ethiopia, which is part of the Sudan that was home to Osama bin Laden in the early 1990s. And Libya, which is formerly led by Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, a sponsor of worldwide terrorism, are with them. All of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, which is South Turkey, and its troops, the house of Togarma, which is northern Turkey, from the far north, and its troops, many peoples are with you. It's worth noting, I, I think, that uh, 
three of the most powerful members of this Gog, Magog alliance are Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And right now, today, Russia, Iran, and Turkey are cooperating in Syria, uh, forming an alliance. Now, this is interesting because Turkey is supposed to be a NATO nation, and NATO is us, are the allies. But they're beginning to wane away from that, and they have for the last four or five years with their latest leader. But it's interesting that, that right now, they are forming an alliance, they are meeting right now, they are cooperating with each other to form an alliance, and this puts their joint military forces right on Israel's north border as we speak. This is what Ezekiel said 2,600 years ago, that these would be the nations that would align with each other in the last day for a war. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about, about you, and be on guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years, there's when it's gonna happen, in the latter years, this is not a war that's already happened. This is not a war that, that happened in some moment of history and just got overlooked. It, this is a latter day war. You will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, 1900 years primarily. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. So Israel's been brought back into the land from all over the world. They're dwelling safely in their land after 1900 years. Verse, verse number nine, you will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many people with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it will come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil which are riches, and to take a prey, which are people. So they're coming down to take riches and people. To stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Now look, look at who's gonna protest this. There are two Arab nations and then United States and Great Britain. And Sheba, Sheba is Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates in Bahrain, and Deden, which is Oman and Yemen, the merchants of Tarshish, which is Great Britain. It was a Tarshish tin land that Jonah got on to run away from Nineveh. So Tarshish is a land of Great Britain, and there are young lions, that means all the nations that have spawned off of Tarshish, which are United States, Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, several nations. There'll be a, that'll be the coalition. And we'll say to you, now I think it's interesting here, that they're gonna, they're gonna say something. It doesn't say that they're gonna fight. It doesn't say they're gonna move against this confederacy to stop them. They're just gonna talk to them. D diplomacy, you know. Uh, have you come down to take a spoil, is what they'll say. Hey, are, are you really gonna come down and attack these pleasant people? Are you really gonna come, tack, come down and attack people that are at peace, that have done nothing against you? That have, I mean, this is the protest that'll be said. And the merchants of Tarshish and their young lions, have you come to take a plunder? Have you gathered your army to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, and take away livestock and good, to take a great plunder? Uh, this is the war that Ezekiel describes that will happen in the last days that will be a trigger that begins to usher in the final events that conclude through the tribulation period under the battle of Armageddon. And I want us to consider just for a few minutes today, are we living in these last days? Are the, what, what time is it? Uh, 
if these are the last days, how, uh, uh, how, how long do we have? And, and, what, and what does that mean? What, 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 should, what should we do about it? Well, let me give you these four signposts, four prophetic signposts of the last days. These are absolutely in the Bible. They are absolutely, they have absolutely been fulfilled. I don't think there's really any question about them. Uh, I don't think they're up for uh, any kind of controversial thoughts about them. These are absolutely in the word and they have absolutely been completed in these days. Now, let me just say something about a signpost. A signpost is, if, you are, if you're taking a journey and it's a long journey and you're on a road that you, don't, you've, you haven't traveled before, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for a signpost occasionally, right? A, a, a sign that says, hey, I'm on the right road. If I'm going from here to Jackson, let's just say, I like to see a signpost every now and then that says, Jackson, uh, 142 miles. Jackson, 97 miles. I mean, I like to, to see the signpost because of what? Because it tells me I'm on the right road. Right, and it also tells me how far I have to go. So these prophetic signposts are tell it, will tell us, all right, are we on the road to the end? And if we are, how far along are we? How, how much more time do we have to go? All right, signpost number one. Signpost number one, Israel becomes a nation again for the second time, and it happens in a single day. Israel is the only nation on the face of this earth that even one time has come back from complete removal of their land, destruction of their language, destruction of their culture, destruction of their economy. They have been totally taken out of a land and have ever came back and occupied that land again. And Israel's not only done it once, they've done it, they've done it twice. And the second time they, they did it, it happened in a single day. Isaiah chapter 11 says, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. Where are you gonna get them from, Lord? From Assyria, which is Germany and Egypt. From Pathros, which is Upper Egypt, and Cush, which is Ethiopia. From Elam and Shinar, which are, is Iran. From Hamath, which means a hostile nation, the nearest hostile nation and the islands of the sea, which are the Mediterranean coastal regions. The, the, the emphasis here is he's gonna get them from lots of places. He's, he's gonna get them from all over. They're scattered everywhere. The second time he gathers them. Now look at what it says, verse 12. He will set up a banner for the nations. One of the more interesting uh, events that happened in the second return of Israel in, in May of 1948 was an operation called Operation Magic Carpet. Operation Magic Carpet happened with the Jewish people that were in the little country of Yemen, which is across the Saudi Arabian desert from Israel. Well, these people didn't have vehicles. These people uh, barely had clothes to wear, and they couldn't walk across the hot sands to get back to the nation of Israel. So uh, the United Nations, which is what the, I'll set up a banner for the nations. The United Nations took United Nations flags, plastered them on American B-52 bombers, sent those bombers down to Yemen, loaded them up with 50,000 uh, Yemeni Jewish people going back to Israel, flew them over Saudi Arabia, landed, and, and not one single one of them was injured, hurt, or anything. These people had never ridden in an automobile, much less flown in an airplane. It was a miraculous thing. They put a United Nations flag on the B-52 because if Saudi Arabia shot down an American plane with an American flag on it, there would be consequences. So they put the United Nations flag so that there wouldn't be any conflict in case that happened. But I, I'm, just, I'm just saying to you that Isaiah saw this, saw this 2,500 years ago. Isn't it interesting? And, uh, and, and he says, and I will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. I told you that Israel has gone into captivity twice. The first time was in 607. I'm not gonna get into much history, so you know, don't get, let your eyes roll on back here, okay? I saw some eyes go, oh, God. All right, 
First time, they, first time they went into occupation was 607. This is when Daniel, the book of Daniel, when Daniel was taken and all the wise young men and, they, and, and Nebuch, the Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar because of Israel's sin, the Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king and the Babylonians to come in and take Israel captive and to take them back to Babylon. They stayed in Babylon for 70 years. And then they were, were returned from Babylon by Cyrus, the king of Persia, 70 years later. And they came back in the land and Ezra and Nehemiah and they rebuilt the wall and they rebuilt the temple and all of that kind of stuff. And they occupied the land again. But now remember, the first time they came back from captivity, they came back from a single place. They were all in Babylon. They were not scattered. They were just in one place in Babylon. The second time Israel was taken from the land was 70 AD. In 70 AD, Titus, the Roman general, who later became the emperor, Titus the, the Great, came in, defeated the Israeli army, killed over a million Jews, took the city, plundered the city, sowed the ground and poured salt in it so it couldn't uh, bear crops any longer, took the temple, took, tore the temple completely down and all of the Jews that he didn't kill, he took them and scattered them all over the known world. And until May 14th, 1948, there was no nation of Israel. From 70 A.D., until 1948, there was not a land of Israel. There was no country of Israel at all. And so Isaiah tells us in chapter 66 that God is going to gather them back and how he's going to gather them back and, and, and that they're going to be gathered back in one day. L look at this, Isaiah 66, 7. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Now, I mean, I think about it because he's going to ask you a question. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Has that ever happened to any of you guys, by the way? Okay, all right. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Has that ever happened to any of them? Well, good. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Israel was part of the land of Palestine. And here's what happened how she was born in one day. The British government had a colonial mandate over the whole area of Palestine. May 15th, 1948, the colonial mandate was set to expire so that British ownership of all the land of Palestine would be over on May 15th, 1948. At four o'clock in the afternoon, listen to it, at four o'clock in the afternoon on May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, who was the leader of Israel, raised the Jewish flag they sang the Nash, Jewish national anthem and they declared Jewish independence. Within 11 minutes, within 11 minutes, the United States President Harry Truman received a request from Israel for the United States to recognize them as a nation and he granted that request. Three days later, Russia granted that request and Israel had been reborn in a single day. A couple of interesting things about this. One is the president before Harry Truman was uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Franklin D. Roosevelt would not, have, would not have signed that, would not have welcomed Israel because of the policies that he had of isolationism and study the history, Google it or whatever you want to. Uh, would not allow him to do that. That was his philosophy. Don't get involved with the world. Uh, Japan had to bomb us before we even got involved in World War II. So anyway, that wouldn't have happened, but he was dead and Harry Truman was president. And then the second thing is, after Harry Truman signed this, a group of Jewish leaders came into his office and, and told him that they believed that, that God had placed him in his mother's womb for a time like this in order to recognize Israel 
as a, to be the man in power to recognize Israel as a nation. And the observers around there said that Truman just stood there and wept. Now this is signpost number one, and it is the greatest signpost because if there's no nation of Israel, there's no end times because all of the end times are about the nation of Israel. If Israel had not come back to the land, there would be, there would be none of the other things that d to do with the end time events would ever happen. So this is the first signpost. It happened May 14th, 1948, and Israel became a nation again. And when Israel came back into the land, May 14th, 1948, the prophetic time clock started ticking again. Signpost number two, Jerusalem is reunited under Jewish control after 1,897 years. Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, is united under Israeli control for the first time in 1,897 years. Here's what, here's what Jesus had to say about this in, in Luke. Now, Jesus is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus is saying Jerusalem's gonna be destroyed and here's how he describes it in Luke 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. This is in 70 AD, by the way. This is when Titus surrounds them. This is Jesus speaking now. Jesus is back in 32. You know, this is 30 years before, 35 years before anything happened. Jesus is saying, all right, this temple, because the disciples have said, when is that temple gonna be destroyed? It's like you've been talking about. And he says, all right, here's, when it go, well, here's how it happens. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you'll know that desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her for these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So Jesus is saying this catastrophic overtaking of Jerusalem is going to happen. And it's going to happen because of the sins of the people. And God's going to allow it to happen. And when it happens, the people of the city are going to be taken captive and scattered all over the world. And Jerusalem will not belong to Israel again until the time of the Gentiles is over. In other words, Jerusalem will be occupied by non-Israeli people until the time that non-Israeli Israeli people is over. And so God is saying, Israel will not occupy its capital, its heart city of Jerusalem until God gives it back to them. Well, in May 14th, 1948, Israel received half of the city of Jerusalem. The East Jerusalem was given to the Palestinians and they did not own the East Jerusalem. It was almost like East and West Germany. You know, they were divided. They only occupied half. Well, in June of 1967, in the Six Day War, Israel took all of Jerusalem. They took the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, they took a lot of things. They were attacked by Arab countries all around. It's an amazing story, wish I had time to tell you, but they just routed them and they took everything. So Jesus says here that Jerusalem will be trampled by the non-Jews until the time that the non-Jews is fulfilled. And so June 1967 is a really important passage because uh, it is at that date that God gave Jerusalem back to Israel with his blessings. What that means is that God has blessed Israel now with Jerusalem, their capital city, and Jerusalem is never going to leave the control of Israel 
until about halfway through the tribulation period when the Antichrist comes and sets up the, uh, the, the pig on the altar and becomes the abomination of desolation and Israel has to run for its life. From, that, from, from, from the time God gave it to them in 1967 until that happens in the middle of tribulation, Jerusalem will always belong to the Jews. Now pay attention because all of the nations of the world right now, including our President Trump, uh, put pressure on Israel, tremendous pressure, and they're still putting tremendous tr pressure on Israel to give half of Jerusalem back to the Palestinians and, uh, and do that so that there will be peace. But what I'm telling you right now is they will never, ever give it back. It's never gonna transfer. That's a signpost. So Jerusalem, until Jerusalem was completely under the control of Israel, end times couldn't proceed. May, uh, June 67, it became that. Signpost number three. The issue of Jerusalem causes the world to unite against Israel. You see what I'm talking about? A tiny little Jerusalem, I mean the capital city in the middle of a tiny little country, causes the whole world to hate Israel. And to unite, this is what unites the entire world is Jerusalem, is the issue of Jerusalem. Give it back to the Palestinians. We're not giving it back, it belongs to God, it doesn't belong to them. God gave them to us, we're not giving it back. Yes, you gotta give it back. It's, that is going to, as a matter of fact, that's gonna be what starts Gog and Magog and the Battle of Armageddon, that, that thought right there. When Israel was reestablished as a nation, the world went crazy. The United Nations went crazy. Zechariah told us this would happen. Look in chapter 12. Here's what Zechariah said. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness. That means reeling. I mean, <laughs> when, when, in other words, Zechariah is saying um, when, uh, when, uh, when, when, when Jerusalem becomes the capital city and they have it all, the whole world is just gonna go crazy like a bunch of drunk people reeling. You know, I mean, that's what he's saying here. I behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Jerusalem is the issue of both the battle of Gog and Magog and the battle of Armageddon. It is a war about who has control of Jerusalem. The United Nations today, right now as I speak, will still not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. In 2017, President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. On May 14th, 2018, the United States moved its embassy to Jerusalem and declared that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. You say, big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. You know why? Because Donald Trump became the first world leader in 2,500 years since King Cyrus of Persia to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital city. The United Nations absolutely despises Israel. The United Nations has a council called uh, the Council, what is it? United Nations Human Rights Council. It is set up to uh, protect human rights around the world. It's populated by 47 state members, now listen, that have included those paramount, paramounts of, 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 of human rights, those great nations of human rights are on the committee. Uh, let's see, I wrote them down, China, uh, worst in the world, North Korea, uh, barely behind China, Iran, uh, go there and try to have any human rights, uh, Pakistan, oh my goodness, Turkey, Russia, Venezuela, Cuba, just to name a few well-known uh, offenders. It's so bad, the Human Rights Council is so bad that in 2018 the United States resigned off of the Human Rights Council to protest such a silly, wicked, evil bunch of idiots. From 2006 to, two, I'm sorry, didn't mean to say it. From 2006 to 2016, listen to this. I'm, I'm just, what I'm, say, what I'm showing you here is how the world is united against Israel. The whole world, not just one or two little Arab nations. This is the whole world. And it's about Jerusalem. All right, 
from 2006 to 2016, the, the, the National Human Rights Council criticized Israel 68 times for violating human rights. Three times more than it criticized any other nation like China, North Korea, <laughs> Pakistan, Iran. Three times more than it criticized any of those well-known human rights defenders. Of 97 resolutions adopted by the United Nations General Assembly between 2012 and 2015, of 97, 83 were against Israel. I'll tell you what you can call the United Nations, the Hate Israel Club, because they despise them. When, when, look, when, when, when Zechariah said, all, all the nations shall come against Jerusalem, uh, you can go ahead and check that box. That box, you can check that because that's exactly what's happened. They hate Israel and they're ready to impose a two-state solution upon Israel that's gonna force them to give away half of Jerusalem and, 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 and most of the West Bank and other sides. Zechariah 14, now, is, a, is, an, is, a, is an Armageddon, it talks about Armageddon and Christ returning to destroy the enemies. Look at what he says. He goes on to say, Behold, the days of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. See, the issue is Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravaged, half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half shall move toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley for the mountain valley shall reach to us all. Yes, you shall flee and, and as, you fled, as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, thus the Lord my God will come, look at this, and all the saints with you. Now, I just, I, I just read that because I want to get to that all the saints with you. I want you to know where you're going to be. You say, all right, when all this stuff is going on and the battle of Armageddon is being fought and Jesus comes down and he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and it splits in half and half of it goes this way and half of it goes this way and it creates a gigantic valley, Valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, it's going to run as deep as horseback. That's created right there. Uh, where, where, where are we going to be? Well, we're going to be hovering about right here watching every, I mean, we're gonna have a ringside seat. And, and it says, when that happens, and all his saints are with him. Are you, are you a saint? You might say, well, not you, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, you are, that's what God called you if, you if you belong to him. And where are you gonna be? You're gonna be hovering right above Jesus' head. You're gonna be looking, you're gonna have a ringside seat to the greatest but shortest battle in the history of the world. And you're gonna watch Jesus just completely destroy the nations with just a word out of his mouth. See, that is, that, that is, that, that's what's going on. The whole world is against Israel, and right now all the pressure of the world are coming against Israel to try to force them to give away Jerusalem. Even President Trump's plan of the century had that in it. I'm just shocked by that, but it, it, it did have that in it. But let me just tell you something. It'll never happen. It'll never, they'll never give that land away. It'll never happen. Signpost number four. The land of Israel is divided. Would y'all believe that I'm just about can't do more, more than this? All right, I'm gonna give you the implications next week, all right? Now, the implications are gonna be something. I mean, what does it mean? What does this mean? But let me give you signpost number four. All right, the land of Israel is divided. Now, I just told you that Jerusalem will not be divided, that God gave it back to them in 67 and they will never let it go. You can forget that. You, you can listen to it. You, I guarantee you, pay attention to what happens. You'll hear it on the news every once in a while. I mean, it'll be, there, there's pressure on Jerusalem to just give that back. Hey, man, let's make the Palestinians happy. Let's, and listen, let me just say something about the Palestinians right now. I, I am not talking, I have nothing against the Palestinian people. I, I don't even, I don't know the Palestinian people. I don't have anything negative to say about the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people are probably wonderful people. Jesus loves the Palestinian people. But their leadership is about the most corrupt, wicked bunch of people. Hamas and Hezbollah, 
that you've ever seen and every peace treaty that has ever tried to be established over there, they have gotten in the way and torpedoed and, and, and didn't let happen and they're just horrible, corrupt, wicked people. So I'm not talking about the typical average Palestinian person. I'm not saying they're sorry people or anything. I'm just saying that this is what God talks about with the land of Israel and the Palestinians are just the people that occupy the, the place around there. By the way, they're all the same race. I, I know it, it, a lot of times people, people try to talk about the Middle East as being a racial war. They're all the same race. They're all Semites. <laughs> They all cousins and, and in-laws. It's just their culture that's different. It's, the, it's their environment that they were brought up in that makes them different. Some of them are Arabs, and then the Jews are Israelis, and they worship God, and the Arabs are Muslims, and they're Allah and all that. Uh, that's the difference. That's the only difference. All right. Israel, the land is divided. So Joel 3, I'll make this one quick. Joel 3, verse 1 and 2. For behold, in those days... I love this line. For behold, in those days and at that time, I like that, it's got a kind of poetic bounce. Behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which means God has judged. Talking about the valley of Megiddo, where Armageddon, where the, the valley of Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon happens. I'm gonna bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. And in the last little line, they have also divided up my land. All right, so the United States with many, with all other nations of the earth have been part of a land for peace deal in, in, in Israel for, for decades. Now, you may not know this, but the United States was very instrumental in forcing Israel. And by forcing, I mean, you know, we're their only ally and they depend on us very heavily. Uh, and, and we used our influence and we used our, our, our standing with them to, to basically force them to give back part of the West Bank. Uh, I don't know if y'all knew that. Back, back in 2005, the Bush administration uh, forced them to give back the Gaza Strip, which is the wealthiest part of the land. Cost Israel billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. What else happened in 2005, by the way? Can anybody, any of you have a good memory in the U.S.? What happened 2005, 2005, 2005? There was a little storm that blew up down here in the Gulf called Katrina. And it, and it blew in on us and cost millions. You know what some of the, some of the rabbis in Israel said publicly? That was God's judgment on this country for making them give back the Gaza Strip. But anyway, let me go on with this. So um, we forced them to give it back and, and, and so forth. And the Bush administration was part of it and they forced them to give back the Gaza Strip. Um, Israel, this, this is the point. Israel does not belong to any man. Israel belongs to God. And God says that judgment will fall. Listen now, God says judgment will fall upon those nations that divide his land. And one of the reasons why God enters into judgment with nations is because he says, you have taken my land and you have given it away to others. The point is, Israel is God's land and God says, I'm coming and I'm going to enter into judgment because you are dividing up the land so you can check that box. So these sign points are before us every week. They're before us every day. They're happening right before our eyes. And so if, if these sign point, if these signposts are true, which I sincerely believe they are, they're biblical, they're part of the timeline of God. What does that mean for us? If we're on the road to the end, how far along are we on the road to the end? And there are three implications. If these are the signposts and they are true, which I believe they are, there are three implications that, that, that are true about them. And I, I guess I'll have to give those to you next week because... I don't have time, right? What about a cliffhanger? <laughs> Dallas and JR, anybody? Or <clears throat> I know you'll wake up next week and you'll say, this was a dream. <laughs> no, it's not a dream. Listen, there is a, there is a very, um, <clears throat> there's a very, I, the first one, and I'm not gonna give it to you, so put your stuff down. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna entice you just a second. 
Um, the first one is probably one of the, you'll get more excited about the first implication of this, but I don't want you to get too, too out of whack with, about it. Uh, in a bad way, because uh, it's uh, it could be it, it could be something that you run out of here and be screaming and all about. Uh, I don't want you to do that. So just go ahead and next week get ready and pray for you. Come and say, all right, Lord, don't let me get overwhelmed when He says this first implication right here, because it's it is pretty it is pretty uh, tough. All right, very, I mean in a good way, tough in a good way. All right, let's stand our feet. I'm sorry.